Right, so uh, I'm Mark Ivan O'Gorman and uh, working under the sort of uh, working title, uh, Musical Avatar of the Spinning Boy, I've uh, started this project called All My Sons. And it was kind of the motivation was, uh, I grew up in Ireland and I had a lot of uh, musician friends, uh, all male, and uh, several of them had mental health issues as uh, young men. And, uh, and several of them who I played with and very close with have subsequently died prematurely. And this had stuck with me uh, for a while. I mean, just at the time I was conscious that there were what would I would later can assess as self-medication in terms of booze and drugs around music. Uh, but then in retrospect, I'm saying, oh, there seems to be maybe mental health issues and certainly psychological and esteem issues maybe surrounding all of that. And so I've decided to uh, develop a, a musical project working with uh, friends of the uh, young men who passed away, uh, which we hope to record and release for Men Health, Men's Health Day in November uh, this year. So uh, <laughs> that's my background as, a, as an artist. And I wanted to speak today with uh, Professor uh, Jane Perkis, Director of the Centre of Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. Jane, hello, how are you doing? Thanks Hi there, Mark Ivan, how are you? I'm very good, thanks. So, you know, this project uh, for me is, is a personal project that I kind of initiated based on my personal experience. And I, I wanted to reach out into a broader issue on, of this subject, of which I have only picked up information anecdotally as an, an amateur interested in the subject. So. This is your this is your field of study. So maybe you can tell me a little bit more about exactly what is your field of study within this context. Sure. Um, but just before I do that, I would say that yeah. lots of people get into the area exactly the way you have through personal right. experience and connections with with people throughout their lifetime. Um, so we've done quite a bit of work um, that's a little bit more specific, maybe that's about yeah. um, male suicide prevention. Um, so we, we've got an interest in male mental health more generally, but a lot of what we've been doing recently is specifically about suicide prevention. And we got interested in the area because um, uh, three quarters of all suicides are by men and boys. So, you know, that if you, if you work in suicide prevention, you can't help but be concerned about men and boys. And we started to wonder why it might be the case that males do dominate suicide statistics as much as they do. And we're not the only people to have thought about it. So people say things like males use more lethal means. They're not so good at reaching out for help. They express emotions perhaps in a different way to females. Um, and also they, and this may relate to what you said at the beginning, they're, they're um, more likely to use drugs and alcohol in, in perhaps dangerous ways. And th those that might be implicated in some suicides. So we started to think about all that, but those explanations, although there's good evidence for, for them, they seemed a bit blunt to us. So, mm. so then we started to think about whether there were kind of causes behind the causes. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, we wondered about the, the way society imposes norms of masculinity on mm -hmm. young boys and mm -hmm. whether, um, whether that might be playing out in some of those, those ways. So, for example... Um, when young boys are growing up, they're told to toughen up and not to cry, mm. which you can see could translate in in later life as being interpreted as not wanting, not not it not being cool to reach out for help. Um, mm. So so we started to think about all of that sort of stuff, and we um, we made a documentary. We worked with a fantastic production company in Sydney um, called Aries Films. We had funding from Movember, who were brilliant. To work with. Oh, yeah. So we made this documentary that was called Man Up. So it was a kind of ironic take on the term Man Up. Um, um, it uh, was, the, so it was a kind of presenter led journey across three episodes. And the presenter was this amazing guy called Gus Warland, who at that stage was a um, commercial radio announcer in, in Australia, quite well known. 
But actually, since the show, he's he does a little bit of radio announcing still, but mostly he set up this foundation that's all about male mental health. It was it was mm. a transformative project for him, and he was just the, the best presenter we could have possibly had. Anyway, so in Man Up, um, Gus goes on this journey where he um, learns about the statistics about male suicide, um, meets a whole lot of people who are who are addressing the problem in different ways, mostly because they've done things like you have. They've, um, they've had personal experiences with friends or family members and they're very, or, or themselves, personal experiences themselves, mm. and they're very motivated to try to, to do something mm. about it. Um, and then in the final episode, Gus sort of takes matters into his own hands and creates this campaign ad, which when, we, when the show went to air went completely viral. It was it was amazing to watch, actually. So we um, we did a randomised controlled trial of the show before it was shown, which demonstrated that the, the men who watched the show um, were, it increased their likelihood that they'd reach out for help if they yeah, were, wow. if they were um, struggling a bit, if they were facing tough times. Um, whereas the men who watched our control documentary, which had nothing to do with mental health, there was no difference for them. So it was quite compelling evidence. And then when the show went to air, it had really broad reach. So it, it was seen by about two and a half million people in Australia. And it's, it was shown on, on the ABC, which is our, um, our public channel. Um, and it's still, so that was in 2016, but it's remained on the catch up um, platform of, at the ABC ever since. Um, so the numbers have increased. People have continued to see it. And as I said, the, sh the um, campaign ad just went totally viral at the time. So it was quite, it was a fantastic project to be involved in. I met lots of amazing people along the way. And, uh, and we also, we nearly won an award. Uh, we nearly won an actor award. So like the Australian version of the Academy Awards. It was very exciting. We, did, we got pipped at the post, but I did get to frock up and go to the awards. Well, that's what it's all about. Uh, that's why anyone about. gets into showbiz <laughs> for the red carpet. Um, well, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a rambling kind of answer to your question, but um, we yeah. So we've we've worked in the area for a while, and we've we've come at it from this fairly um, not not quite theoretical standpoint, but um, sort of an evidence based standpoint, um, mm. and tried to look at if if it is something about masculinity so that so man up the show had lots lots of stuff about how boys are brought up to to be tough and stoic and hold it all in mm. um, and how that might be playing out so um so it's been it's been really a really good experience can i ask with the you're saying how effective the documentary show was about in terms of resonating with uh, men what components or how was the nature of the address to yeah. men that made them go oh this is okay for me to well I think there were a few things so so Gus was very relatable Gus is mm. kind of he's he's very likable he um mm. he had his own experience with his best mate taking his own life and that was quite mm. um a sort of fairly prominent introduction to the show it was clear that that was that was his motivation um but there are a lot of other people in the show who are also very relatable and likable. Um, and we did this exercise where we we looked at all of the um, all of the data we had from the trial, and we all looked at we had we did a survey at the time, and we looked at a whole lot of social media stuff to look at which parts of the show people seem to really talk about mm. a lot. And there mm. were two parts that people just completely dominated people really liked one mm. was um there's a a guy here called tom harkin who runs these workshops with high school boys um the the um workshops are called breaking the man code and it, it, they're all about that thing about challenging those traditional masculine norms mm. with high school boys and mm. um so there so there were snippets of a workshop that he ran which actually Gus's son was in the class at the time, um, and um, it was it was very moving. The boys you could you you watched the boys' transformational journey in this 
fairly brief workshop. It was, I'm not quite sure how long it goes for, but it's no more than a couple of hours. And, and mm. the audience of Man Up only saw snippets of it, but it was very moving. So people loved that. And the other thing people really liked, there was a segment where um, Gus was sort of a, a silent observer of mm. um, the the telephone workers taking calls at Lifeline, our, our um, mm. national crisis line. So he obviously couldn't hear the person on the other end of the call, but he could hear the responses of the mm. Lifeline workers. And mm. um, and that was very moving as well. So so there were, I guess there are two things. There were, it, it, it was a topic of three things maybe. It was a topic that was very um, dear to a lot of people's hearts. You know, it's, Mm. suicide unfortunately is um is uh common enough that most people will have had some experience of knowing someone mm. who's um mm. to some degree who's taken their own mm. life so there was that there was the fact that there were these segments that were very um very uh kind of poignant i guess and um and people understood the understood the issue. It was very, Gus presented it very well. It's you know it's quite a simple idea really that although um, although there are multiple masculine norms and also mm. um, obviously there are some 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 things that are great about being stoic and being able mm. to deal with everything. You know, if you're mm. in a building that's on fire, that's exactly the kind of qualities you want yeah. in the person who comes to save you. But it is also clear. That, they, that that might um, act against men reaching out for help if they're, if, if they're not travelling so well? Yeah, I mean, because I have a, you know, my instinctive response, again, I, none of this is based on any, any research, but I guess a mood. Okay, so the mood I feel in terms of a response to this, this kind of phenomena is, you know, we have identified that men uh, are um, are suffering from a sense of this stoicism, which does not does not allow them to reach out because it shows vulnerability, mm. um, strength, uh, and uh, it's it's a very important part of being a man. And this can be an obstacle in maybe getting help. And, and so then the, the conversation gets framed and this idea of going, okay, so there's a problem there is that men yeah. are too, and then it's projected going, so the problem we have to fix is this, you know, toxic masculinity is yeah. men are also, and I see a, an inherent obstacle there for men, which is, yeah, if I'm in, uh, society says this, but actually nobody really wants this on one level is that we kind of want men to be strong, actually. I mean, as you pointed out, very yeah. important, the house is on fire. So like, where's, <laughs> where's yeah. the strong fireman going to yeah. kick down the door and make all the decisions? We don't want the vulnerable. I feel, my feelings right now is I feel we're going to burn. Yes. Yeah. So it, this is what I think is interesting is how to reconcile these two ideas in terms of communicating the conversation to make yeah. men feel a little bit more proactive and a little bit more sense of uh, the vigorousness, the sense of autonomy, the sense of going that actually I'm not, this is not a weakening. This is somehow there's a strength. Absolutely, that's right. Process. Yeah, so, so it's, okay. it's not, um, yes. So first, first of all, it's not, um, it's not a comment at all on any individual men. Um, mm. it, 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 you know, we're all a product of the society that we grow up in. Um, mm. the, and the other thing to say is you're absolutely right. It's, it's, not, um, it's not that there is a, a problem with any, any mm. individual man at all. Um, mm. uh, but, you know, there, there is a problem with male suicide. And, yes. Um, and yes. so okay. if, if <laughs> that's a starting a way, point. Mm. Yeah, if there's a way of um, thinking through for at least some of those men who end up in that situation that they can't see any other way out, if there's a way of thinking through how things might have been different for them, I think that's definitely worth doing. Um, but, but you're also right, you know, that so there's lots of conversations about um, the language that gets used. And, um, you know, I think I said earlier, 
um, that the men in our trial um, who viewed man up were more likely to seek help. Help seeking is a term that actually isn't all that helpful to use. <laughs> a, a much more helpful way of talking about it is is um, taking control or fixing problems. Mm. It's, it, mm. As you said, it's much more kind of proactive. Mm. So, so we do try to um, use that sort of language, and that that was very clear in Man Up. So, um, some of the some of the people that Gus met mm. um, were had had set up programs for men on construction sites and in uh, farming communities. So, you know, fairly um, fairly mm. tough gigs. These these yeah, programs yeah, yeah. That these guys were running. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. But and they they were very careful about the language they used. But and they were mm. so um, they were so widely picked up that it, it was quite amazing. You know, really they mm. they were um, they, they had a lot of impact. And a, a lo- I think a mm. lot of it was taking this nub of an idea, but communicating it the right way so that it does resonate. You're right. Yeah, I think the communication and language is very interesting because it's also the framing of what uh, the issue, because I think you, you just that point. Yeah. So let's, and I'm making broad sweeping statements here, but you're saying seeking help, right? So we go, this is like, you know, that joke about men not asking for directions, you know, it's like, it, whether it's cultural or whether it's evolutionary, you know, this idea of going, I must so it's on me to sort out this problem, okay? Which yeah. great equality in many circumstances. Yeah. But when you are the problem, you being trying to be the solution of it is not the most effective way. So this notion of seeking help is what's important. But you know, this kind of collegiate community way of dealing with things is hmm. certainly a, a traditionally more feminine thing. You communicate, you try and seek help, you yeah. you, you get in views, and we'll do it. And the men normally don't like that but i think it's very interesting you're going oh you are seeking help you're you are the one acting in your own interests and you're doing an activity and that just happens that you're going to the expert in this field yeah. like you would get in a plumber or you would get in that's right right, exactly. Some, right. so it's yeah. the same as you said it's you're actually doing the same thing but rather than the implication being well the way you do stuff is inadequate <laughs> you know yeah, or, totally yeah and mm-hmm. absolutely um, that's not the message. It definitely mm. shouldn't be the message. Yeah. Um, it's also interesting, though, that um, so we're doing some some work now um, where we're testing some some other kinds of approaches to encouraging men who might not be travelling so well to mm. put out their hand and say, perhaps I'm not travelling so well. Mm. But but we've also realised, obviously, it's a pretty obvious realisation that. Um, that if they do go to someone for professional help and yeah. they don't get a service that works for them, that could make things like that's a double yeah. whammy. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so part of this program of work we're doing at the moment is also testing some different ways of, um, of mental health professionals and actually lifeline workers um, delivering services to men in a way that might appeal to them a bit more so to make sure yeah. that, and and a lot of that's about language so we've, we've got this sure. fantastic guy here called Zach Seidler who's a, a young psychologist yeah. who's developed this um program called Men in Mind and he's training yeah. other psychologists and it's a lot of it's quite simple it's it's about thinking through how um how the societal influences all work but but just reframing a bit mm. of language and so you're saying the delivery of this method of 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 help or you know what what is the difference with the this one that they feel is more suitable for well, men so, it, so it's it's um still in its infancy he's so yeah. he has developed the program and we're going to test it but um it, it's it's really quite simple things like um like things to do with language so um okay instead of uh instead of and 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 probably i don't know whether zach would like me describing it this way but not quite mm. so touchy feely as yeah, yeah as um yeah, yeah. uh maybe more traditional kind of psychological yeah. approaches uh, but a lot of a lot of psychology is actually about um problem solving and that that framed the right sure. way that definitely resonates with men 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's very interesting, like the Men Shed project, which is, <laughs> for me, maybe I find a very charming notion that it's kind of, in many ways, it's like, it's not a direct approach at all. It's more, you That's know, right. Uh, right? You're going, we're not going to focus on an issue and just delve into it because uh, I don't know, we can, uh, that can be difficult and problematic and maybe not entirely helpful and a sort of a pity party, you know? And you go, we're just going to all hang out and we're going to have fix a car, you know? Yeah. And in the process of leaning over a carburetor or whatever, there's all of the things that people need. Because yeah, I know I know the little I know of that project, it has been directed to sort of middle-aged men who were exceedingly getting isolated. And, you know, so the fact that they were just doing a collective thing made their mental health generally better. They're in that's the right. community. There's yeah. a channel it's, of it's conversation. It's very powerful. So, so mm. that same project I'm talking about where we're testing a whole lot of different approaches, one of those is an approach in men's sheds using um, a program called Mental Health First Aid, which, okay. again, is very simple. It's about, you know, how, how mm. um, uh, if, if someone ha has, is having a heart attack, not everybody, but a, a good proportion of the population have got basic CPR training. But if someone mm. is in a mental health crisis... People aren't so well trained to know what to do. So mental health, mm. that's the premise behind mental health first aid. And they have a more specific um, uh, kind of sub-program that's about suicide and suicide prevention and training people to, um, to feel comfortable about asking someone fairly directly if they're concerned about them. Mm. Um, so we're running this, this mental health first aid program in men's sheds or we, we will be. We're not quite at that point yet. That's interesting. But, yeah. yeah. So, and for that, for the very reason that you're saying, that it's a it's an environment that's kind of tried and true. Men like it. Men who mm. might well be otherwise a bit isolated like it. Mm. Um, they talk about, I, I really like this expression, they talk about talking sideways in men's sheds. So they'll be, you know, doing mm. something with their tools and they, they don't have to face <laughs> each other. They talk sideways to each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah which uh, whatever it makes me laugh because it's so on the nose but I just also think there are sort of you know um male activities that would not necessarily historically be considered in the context of like I think of you know I I never went fishing angling or stuff when I was a kid because I was all see men sitting on the side of the river just looking at the river and going this is not fun sports it's the yeah. most boring thing in the world but in the context of going is that not just mindfulness is that not yeah. just some dude having an acceptable mm. uh activity that's acceptable as a thing that a man does where you know a more uh, kind of progressive hipster would be going to meditation and yoga but you know looking yeah. at a spot and just reflecting absolutely so it's definitely it, it horses seems, for courses yeah. Definitely horses yeah. for courses. And also I think that to do something useful, um, it's important to, to reach boys and men where they naturally hang out. So in their right. workplaces and in their schools and in their sporting mm. clubs or whatever, you know. So, again, this program we're doing at the moment, we've got some other approaches that we're testing that are run in sporting clubs, um, that, uh, in um male dominated workplaces like um probably mining sites we we're, we're thinking about oh, yeah. um and um in schools uh and and main sheds as i said well that kind of brings me on to a sort of the broader question like in terms of how do you feel both uh, culturally or maybe like in australia or anglophone words about kind of culturally where men are historically and how that affects the data and also just socially like you're saying about a male dominated uh, workplace now they're becoming fewer and fewer by the nature of how work is changing miners it's very old fashioned version of labor you're some dude chopping at a coal face but most jobs now have turned into office jobs information jobs service jobs stuff, which has been increasingly dominated by the skills women have so how do you feel that broader, uh, I guess, um, that's work, that's a social, and then also kind of the conversations around all the kind of the, the contemporary feminism and the discussion in, 
you know, whether it's the Time Self, Me Too movement and all of that. How do you think any of the other those things play yeah. into this quite well, think, old issue? Yeah, I don't know. I think all of them just underscore that we, we are all products of our um, social environment. Um, mm. and, and also that um, societal norms aren't fixed, that they do mm. change over time. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and obviously people have different influences on them and, and different, mm. um, uh, different people in their lives, that kind of thing, a and are very influenced by their own experiences. So I think all of the things you're mentioning kind of fit mm. in with that. Um, and, and the other thing I'd say is, which I think I said at the beginning, is that um, uh, it's not as though there is a single masculine norm either. No. There are multiple masculine norms. So, yeah. um, but we've, we've just been focusing on this. Um, if, I had to, if I had to use one um, noun, I'd say stoicism. We've been really focusing mm. on this um, mm. kind mm. of uber stoicism and trying to mm. maybe shift the needle on that a bit. Um, mm. it, uh, it, not, not within individual men, but within the way sure. um, society views me. But I, I, I and I know, I mean, like, I, I just ask you to kind of reflect on all of modern culture and, and <laughs> you know, bottle it in. But I mean, is there any data to suggest that it's getting harder for men in society or easier dealing with these things? Because I under, we can say there's more of an understanding like your work you're doing yeah. and more activity at the level of a kind of, to help it. But are the other, uh, trends making yeah. it more difficult in terms it's a very of... good question and i don't know the answer and i suspect that nobody mm. actually knows the answer to that <laughs> uh i think you're right <laughs> uh, but i just i think there's an interesting thing i look at a thing uh like uber uh, in the states uh gig work people's traditional yeah. jobs are gone and then they're all taken and then uber says now we're going to automate the cars going to drive themselves so suddenly you have, I don't know, what, 60,000, 100,000, I don't know how many people work as truck drivers, or they're mostly men, and suddenly they're going, the, the tool is going to do it itself. Yeah. You know, and in that environment, you're going, whether men are no longer breadwinners, yeah. I think they certainly define themselves in their job. Uh, that I guess a lot of people do. I mean, a lot of people do, but I definitely think, uh, so, I mean, do we have any data, any research on that, let's say, just work, the, the, the kind of men feeling of use? Um, there's, there's definitely data on, um, I don't know about that kind of population level data about whether, mm. whether mm. Um, you know, if you did this litmus test about whether men as a group felt yeah. less of use. <laughs> As, yeah. as the kinds of things you're talking about yeah. come into play. So I don't, I mm. haven't seen any data like that, but what mm. I have seen is data about um, the, the, the kinds of um, work environments that are not so great for, for actually anyone's mental health. So not just men, but women too. And they're mm. jobs where um, people have, um, little control basically over mm. over their work um mm. so so low kind of autonomy in their in their jobs mm. which kind of makes sense um uh i was going to say something else then what was that um oh and i was also going to say there there's also data on transition points in people's lives so mm. retirement is a tricky time for a lot mm. of people and maybe mm. particularly men who mm. have had that or particularly anyone perhaps who's had, yeah. uh, viewed themselves as the breadwinner mm. and also and define themselves as you say by sure. their work, um, and and maybe just feel a bit. Um, uh, I've got a friend who's just retired who describes himself feeling as a bit redundant, and it's it's not like he's you know his mental health is pretty good, but he's, mm. he's struggling a bit. He he's looking for things to replace um, mm. his what had been a massive part of his life with mm. and his, his um, kids are grown up. He's not feeling as needed by them, you know, so 
he's, mm. he's kind of feeling like he just needs to redefine his purpose a bit. Well, that's interesting. I guess that's what I'm getting at about the nature of identity. Because, like, it, it, it seems, as I understand from the work you're involved in, it's looking at the point when people are in some, some low-level low crisis and going, at that point, what, what option do you take? And you're saying, well, there's better ways of dealing with this than others, and we yeah. try and push. But that's at the end of the chain. And so the, the impetus behind this, obviously, people have personal psychologies and all that. Individual. But if we're looking at a, a population and you are talking about men and then you're going, what are the impacts on men? Uh, are they? See, I don't know. It's very hard, I think, with figures around suicide because historical figures around suicide are quite difficult, I'm sure, to get your hands on about how much reporting of suicide had traditionally been done. Uh, so, I mean, do you feel there are clear statistics on how that has been uh, um, it how depends that has changed where, over time. It depends where you are. So mm. international comparisons are difficult to make because mm. um, some places are, are, you know, there are more sort of societal sanctions surrounding suicide. Um, mm. And actually in some places there are suicide is still illegal. So that obviously mm. influences the extent to which a death gets deemed to be a suicide. But I think it's fair to say that in um, in many countries now, mm. suicide statistics are pretty reasonable. It's just that there's a, a lag in them because they involve um, usually a coroner or um, a medical examiner um, investigating the death. And that, that process by necessity can sometimes take quite a long time so so there's a bit of a lag in suicide statistics but but in a lot of places these days the statistics are probably pretty accurate yeah I guess I I, I, I guess over time I mean in terms yeah. of how can you assess uh, what were the suicide rates like in the UK 60 years ago were yeah. they were they reported? at the same level. Yeah, def definitely there are, I know in Australia, for example, the over time the reporting has changed and, and we know mm. when different different things happened to the way deaths were recorded as suicides. Mm. Um, so you're right, looking over, looking over the long term is difficult, but looking over the sort of um, midterm is pretty reasonable still. So yeah. you know, most, most places that have reasonable data would have had reasonable data for at least 20 or 25 years. Mm. Um, yeah. The, the other thing to say, though, is um, even ha having just said what I said about data being reasonably mm. accurate, there are um, deaths where it's difficult to know whether it was a suicide or not, yeah. and, and they yeah. may be called a suicide or not. So um, yeah. in particular, drug overdoses and... Mm. Um, single vehicle accidents it's mm. it's sometimes a bit tricky to tell yeah i mean i think also with drug it's you the incident may not be clear if it goes accidental overdose uh, but i think people close can often see a behavior over a long period of time that suggested a treatmentship a flirting with it that yeah. you're going, why? They kept putting themselves in that position and they weren't putting themselves in that position because they were having a great time. They were, yeah, yeah, right? So it's, it, it was an accident waiting to happen in some ways. No, well, I guess, and as you, you're saying, you know, there may be no answer to this, but I am curious about what, um, what rather than it being mental health at crisis level, about what is a... Is there a preventative everyday kind of behaviors that can be incorporated into sort of the, the, a lifestyle that stops mm. people getting to the point where they're think, having suicidal ideation or a kind of yeah. at that crisis level? Well, I think a lot of it is about um, being connected. Mm. You know, that's very protective. And, and that, mm. that's a two-way thing because people... Mm. People around you can make sure you're connected and, and um, mm. you, you can hopefully um, actively try to cultivate or, or, mm. um, 
or maintain connections. But but mm. when people are kind of um, not travelling so well, that's very difficult for them to do. So there is an mm. onus on, on people around them to kind of keep an eye out for them, I think. Um, and um, uh, other, other things that are just sort of obvious, like, you know, good, good physical health is good for your mm. mental health. Mm. Mm. I think connected is a very interesting thing because, I, you know, it's well established, you know, the social uh, contexts of, of, of humans have behaved and everything. And, but, I, you know, I think there are kind of certain qualities, innate qualities, and the sort of, it is an innate kind of masculine quality in general to this idea of lone wolf, individualistic and all that. And that, again, as we said, it's like being, the assertive one, it's quite useful. Mm. But if your tendency is to be solitary and then you find you're getting in a rut mentally, physically, there's no one there to kind of go, you're not encouraged, yeah. you're not bumped up, you know? And, and no, I think- it's it's really yeah. hard. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, women tend to be more conscious of in their community, engaging mm. with their friends and family and- mm. Uh, means that they're going, well, I have to go out now and go and see my mother. I can't go out looking like this. So I'll make an effort and I'll yeah. myself. And then psychologically, I'll cheat myself up and, and go out and do it and they feel better. Uh, men I, think that's why things like, yeah. I think that's why things like men's sheds have been so successful yeah. because they're, uh, they're not overtly about being connected, but, mm. you know, they're overtly about going and, you know, fixing a car or whatever. Yeah. Um, but they, they're very they're very good way to maintain connections. You're saying, you know, I think it's interesting, you've got transitions as well. So transition is, the na- again, about identity. So if you're working as the CEO and then you're retiring, your identity has changed from important person to yeah. what, right? So um, in the transition, like I think in terms of connectivity is interesting. When... What are the transitional moments in terms of connectivity? Like, I, it just, as you're speaking there, it struck me like sport, being a participating sport is a quite a, a comfortable, uh, connective activity that yeah. men do. But that then tends to change in their 40s. They tend to go, and I'm not on the football team at mm. 40 or I'm not. Mm. So you tell me, what have you found in terms of what are those transitional moments or what fit? Uh, what are the big changes that are challenging? Yeah, so, well, there are, so there are key transitional moments, like, you know, retirement, as I said, is one, but there are also developmental transitional type periods. So, so you know, leaving school and establishing yourself as an adult, that's a tricky time for lots of people as well. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so there are other transition points, but... Um, but I, and you're right, there are different reasons why transition points might be difficult. And one of them might, one of them is about that thing to do with purpose. And the other is about mm. um, the thing to do with connect, connectivity. Um, mm. uh, so I guess it's um, thinking about what you might want to do about that um, is, is addressing those sorts of things. So I guess it's looking for alternatives. It's alternative alternatives in your life that are also purposeful and alternatives that um, might maintain connections. Hmm. Uh, you, you know, you, you're saying, you know, men, in some ways, these transitions can be more tricky for men. And it, it seems that women, either by nature or nurture, uh, tend to have a higher level of introspection, uh, which can, makes life more difficult for them, often because there's been a lot more time in their own head going, I mean, doing the right thing, should have done that. And men were blissfully <laughs> unaware of that, mostly, and it makes them. But it does mean at the point when the, they have to, at those big challenges, they have no practice, they have no flexibility, and hmm. that's why it's so more traumatic. And I just think it's interesting, like that point of retirement, like if you never spend the day introspecting about where you are in your life and just on your goal oriented and then one day gone well the goal is moved that goal is gone Mm. then you're like oh i have no skills of that so is there have been people been talking about a kind of ongoing mindfulness of for men but but i know you're saying about the 
the first aid thing's great was about the buddy stepping in and going, yeah. I see there may be a problem. But have they kind of, is there been patterns of behavior that have been recommended for men to kind of, you know, try doing well, more think, of this in your life? I, um, I mean, you're right about mm. mindfulness. People, mm. it's, there's a whole movement and people seem to find it very helpful. Um, mm. But the other thing I'd say is the thing that I said earlier about a lot of psychologist practice, so, you know, things like cognitive behavioural therapy, mm. boil down to teaching people some good problem-solving skills. Mm. And, and it's, it is about practice. So it's about going, I recognise that situation because mm. I was in it before and I, I, I learned how to deal with it last time and I, I, now I know what to do this time. Communication, good, good communication is often seen as a, a female thing. Mm. Um, mm. So it is about... The, doing the same things that a woman in the same situation would do if they were finding themselves mm. in a situation where things didn't seem to be going quite right, mm. but maybe reframing it so that it's it's um, in the context of what what the same man feels mm. comfortable with. So it, it mm. is things like you know, um, uh, if you're going to if you're going to be looking for different activities to give yourself that purpose again, um, there'll be different activities perhaps. So it's it's mm. it's the same principles, but just tailored, I guess. Mm. Yes. Okay. And as you say, changing the language, changing yeah. the mental yeah, yeah. approach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I do think if the, you know there is, I, I kind of touched on it already that if you go a lot of you know your mental health problems are to do with the fact that you know your innate coping skills are in you know, inadequate, then it's a kind of a loop. You're going, oh, I'm crap at doing this because I'm inherently crap at doing this, yeah, you know. Yeah. And they go, no, it's not. It's just it's been communicated to you that this is the way to address the problem. But, like, I think terms you've brought up about problem solving uh, yeah. is a very useful reframing of the thing, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. The idea of connectivity going, there's nothing wrong with that. There's a, what else did you say? taking control as opposed to help. I mean, yeah. these are effectively getting to the same destination. Exactly. Like that's different. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just in a way that uh, they're more likely to be taken up. Yeah. And, and so what, uh, what is the current uh, focus of your study in, 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 the, in the Center for Mental Health? I know you kind of said at the beginning, you're going, we were looking at suicide. It turns out two thirds of suicide victims are men. So we had to look at, man so what what's the current area it's actually worse of... than that it's three quarters um oh so three quarters yeah the, the big the big male suicide um project that we're doing at the moment which i've alluded to is this one where we're looking at a whole range of different approaches so um mm. so as i said the um mental health first aid in men's sheds um we we're testing the we're actually testing the breaking the man code uh program that featured on man up um, which mm. is run in schools, another program that's run in sporting clubs that's called Ahead of the Game. So they all, mm. and, and a few others. So they all have similar principles. They're all about this kind of notion of um, trying to work out what might work for men um, if they're not, if they find themselves not quite in the right place. How, how might mm. they get themselves beyond that? And mm. they're all about, um, uh, again, as I said before, reaching boys and men where they they kind of work, live, and play. Because mm. I mean, right. that's another thing. You know, it's it's probably not reasonable to expect a man who has been nowhere near mental health services mm. or any sort of support for mm. for his entire life to suddenly go right. I'm going to nip off down to the psychologist tomorrow. Mm. Um, um, meeting them somewhere where they they congregate anyway, and also yeah. um, uh, where there are other men like them who, if if they're sort of kind of accepting of um, this kind mm. of slightly altered view, mm. it's more likely that this one man mm. will be. Ah, okay. I guess, and that's interesting because that also plays into men's physical health, which is a traditional yeah. issue, is that men don't, they let things malinger and go, oh, sure, it's only that thing on my back. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally. Fine. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that, yeah, mm. that's, uh, yeah, okay. 
<laughs> okay, that all makes sense. Listen, Jen, I've I've hugged your time for an hour now. That's all right. It's been great to chat to you. I have yeah. to say, for someone who said at the beginning that you were really just dabbling in the area and you didn't know very much, you seem to know quite a lot. <laughs> well, I <laughs> well, I I not knowing anything about a subject has never stopped me having loads of opinions <laughs> on it. And um, okay, thank you very much. I like My to pleasure.